Good evening. Welcome to MUFON Los Angeles. My name is Steve Marillo. I am the State Section Director for MUFON LA. We have a very interesting uh, guest tonight. He's going to be talking about UFO propulsion. His name is Thomas Vallone, PhD. And he's a physicist, a licensed professional engineer with over 30 years of professional experience. He's a former patent examiner, a research engineer, instrumentation designer, CEO, and currently an author, lecturer, and consultant on future energy developments. Dr. Vallone will be speaking to us tonight about energy systems of UFOs and attempts to duplicate this technology uh, for use by humans. Magnetism is the only force in nature not directly harnessed for energy usage. While some UFO reports describe permanent magnet-powered craft, building a practical repl replication is often very elusive. Vallone will give us a description of the historical UFO connection to the study of electrogravitics which is the subject of two of his books. He will speak about electrokinetics and a groundbreaking Norton Air Force Base demonstration of this technology. He will also be screening a short clip from Discovery Channel's Strangest UFO Stories, which features his commentary. He will also be discussing and signing his new book, Zero Point Energy, The Fuel of the Future. Would everybody put your hands together and welcome Dr. Thomas Vallone. First of all, I thought I'd give you a little bit of orientation in case any of you are disoriented. We are right over here. Um, the Milky Way has a very strange black hole in the center, and astronomers are learning more and more about how strange it really is. We have um, interest in what's happening at the center, of course, for two reasons. One is the fact that the black hole at the center seems to not only pull a matter in, but also send energy outward. And this could be a problem for people living on the far edge of the uh, spiral arms. And the interesting thing for us, the second reason, is that the spiral arms uh, technically are the younger stars of the galaxy. And so you have to start to think as you look at the galaxy and how it's laid out in terms of its millions of years of evolution, um, perhaps there's something going on as far as the internal central portion versus the spiral arms, which is the younger crowd. And we certainly are the younger crowd. Well, what is the younger crowd doing today? We're advertising their artificial activity. Every night, we have lots of lights showing, hey, there's something happening on this Earth. So anyone cruising by for up to, say, 50 light years? Because for 50 years, we've been turning lights on and sending out television and all kinds of other electromagnetic signals. <clears throat> and, of course, there might be some unidentified frivolous objects, such as Pona Las Aetnes. But to point out the interesting study of UFO-related phenomena, I point to the 1998 uh, Washington Post cover article. And this was a great um, endorsement of the importance of studying and looking for new energy concepts in terms of advanced technologies that are related to UFOs. This is in the Journal of Scientific Exploration, volume 12, number three. And what I point out and emphasize is the fact that the gravitational and inertial effects are one of the areas that they, uh, the scientists um, who authored this are emphasizing as a very important area for study and, of course, uh, development. <clears throat> and the unexplained phenomena is really um, the point of uh, needing scrutiny. Now, to show you what has been happening lately in terms of books that have been um, uh, revealing the technological back engineering that we're in, uh, encouraging, this new book uh, came out recently, just I believe a year ago, uh, specifically trying to show people what the patches of each of the Area 51 groups are representing. And of course, this particular one, uh, Lifetime of Silence, so showing high security, gives you an exact location of Area 51, just in case you weren't sure where it was. <laughs> this is the title of the book, a very warm, encouraging type of fuzzy uh, title, right? I could tell you, but then it would have to be destroyed by me. Um, and he took, uh, spent years interviewing Black Project workers, engineers, and scientists um, to accumulate some of these patches. I picked out the most interesting ones, I thought, that related to technology. And after you start studying these, you kind of wonder what they think of the technology and what they're using it for. 
This is a general consensus of lay people in, in regards to the military industrial complex that Eisenhower worried, wondered about years ago. And of course, the Black Project's secret budget that ends up being um, uh, not accounted for. And as you can see, global engagement, uh, a lot of uh, morbid um, freedom in the cosmos, but the emphasis is on dominance and, uh, and death-related type images. <clears throat> National Reconnaissance Office, interestingly enough, um, is one area that I have a little bit of experience in. Uh, I was at a National Space Society conference a couple of years ago, and um, they featured a National uh, Reconnaissance Office speaker, but gave a pseudonym. So when he showed up, it was the deputy director, Bennett Hart. And he gave this very interesting uh, staff meeting type of uh, presentation. And I was kind of put off by it being in the audience because he basically said to the audience, we need major muscle moves to get our satellites every month up into the air, you know. And the NRO is something, when I ask most people, what, do you know the, what the NRO stands for? Very few people can even recite the title. And the funny thing is, the NRO is bigger than the CIA. <laughs> and yet they're very secretive, obviously. But the fact that he's calling for major muscle move, I thought was a very quotable phrase. And you can see the emphasis he's placing on the importance of getting all his satellites up there uh, on a regular basis. So um, uh, the, uh, the other part to the story is I um, pigeonholed him as he left his podium outside the door to specifically ask him about declassifying uh, one technology, for example. I'm an advocate, and I have been for 30 years now, of declassification of at least one technology every year that relates to energy and or, and or propulsion. I feel the, the civilian crowd needs it. Our economy definitely needs it. The climate definitely needs it. Global warming is something that no matter what you think it's caused by, if we have a carbonless um, technology that's providing either energy and or transportation propulsion, it would immediately ameliorate the carbon emissions. So what he pointed out, and I have a slide I'll show you uh, shortly, <clears throat> is that um, as I pitched to him the, the mutual benefit to the space tourism crowd, which was at the National Space Society, all the billionaires were there. Virgin Galactic was represented by um, uh, Branston and so forth. The uh, interesting thing was he admitted that this technology I'm gonna show you about inertial shielding uh, was something that was probably highly classified. And he specifically indicated that when a technology like that is classified, it tends to go up higher and higher until it's out of sight in terms of classification, top secret levels. He said it's cheaper for us to reinvent it by hiring a contractor to reinvent the project uh, technology and it'll come out at a lower classification level. And I said, well, isn't that like the taxpayer has to pay twice for something that's really important? <laughs> and he admitted that was true. Yeah. But he said he would do what he could to help uh, declassify stuff. But as we know, even at the patent office, things that are secretized, and there's almost 5,000 patents now, if you go to um, Federation of American Scientists, FAS.org, you can look at the annual report about secretized patents, and they keep going up and up in terms of numbers. So right around 5,000. And they don't tend to be declassified until about 50 years later. So the poor inventor has done all this great work superseding every known technology, finally gets into the stratosphere of secret classified stuff, gets swatted with a secret order, and basically most of them don't get any um, royalties, you know, uh, from what I heard. So it's a difficult conundrum and it's been going on for about 50 years skimming off the top of the highest and most advanced technologies <clears throat> until we're basically driving around in World War II technology uh, gasoline engines. So as you can see all these different um, th this is a, a playoff on one of the Twilight Zone um, episodes. <laughs> I, 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 this is so bad I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> this is the, the alien view of mankind supposedly from the Area 51 Black Project crowd. Um, but um, uh, you get the message, you get the impression. <clears throat> so moving on, 
hopefully we will have some uh, lobbying effort in that regard from Washington or from out here in California. But the question needs to be asked, how can civilians visit Mars? Well, I would suspect and propose that we certainly cannot reach there by burning fuel. And this has been proven, literally, by three major efforts to develop a space plane, the uh, National um, Space Plane Project, National Aerospace Plane Project, 1986. Uh, that was canceled in 1993, um, basically because it couldn't really operate. There was questions about, they didn't really know how to operate it at hypersonic speeds. Now, the Delta Clipper has a very famous video in which you see it trying to land, and then all of a sudden it falls over. <laughs> So they got canceled in 1996 after the accident was destroying it. And then the funniest thing, Lockheed Martin, you kind of wonder where these guys are coming from, if they also have lots of black projects. Um, X-33 was their greatest new attempt to design something to replace the shuttle. And what do they design? A wedge-shaped lifting body that basically was a thin-skinned um, fuel holder and they realized they still couldn't pack enough fuel into the X-33 to go up into space and come back. Um, composite tanks of liquid helium, liquid uh, hydrogen. And so that was canceled after uh, uh, 2001. This is in popular science, by the way, uh, 2003. So with three failures, we kind of wonder about fuel. I think everyone should have that question in mind. Fuel is not necessarily the way to get transportation. And furthermore, as you might know already, as we get into the late 2000s, 2010, we're past Hubbard's peak. We passed it years ago with the United States, and now the world peak is expected uh, any time now. And then, like the 1970 US peak, it never returns to that high volume of production. Oil production's constantly decreasing. And I have lots of charts and graphs when I talk about future energy to prove such a thing. So we're, we're on our way out, and in 2002 on CNN, I was trying to warn the world, but of course they didn't listen. <laughs> but the impending cri oil crisis was really what I was seeing, and of course many experts had already anticipated that and were warning about it. <clears throat> but hopefully the change of administration is going to uh, cause us to really look at newer technologies, new energy technologies, and clean technologies as well. And that's where the back engineering concepts also help. And our uh, institute, my Integrity Research Institute, um, is dedicated to energy research and education with scientific integrity. We also sponsor conferences and books and reports, uh, some available after presentation. And the advocacy for the common good without favoritism is very important, especially when you're looking to maintain our nonprofit status. Well, the projects in future energy that are related to UFOs um, are four major topics. And as I developed this talk over the past several years, I started to realize, oh, maybe I have one topic, maybe I have two. Well, it turns out there's actually four. And these are areas I've already been interested in, but I didn't realize until I looked at the history of what I've been through, how intimately involved with the UFO community and UFO technologies they really are. Well, since you're in California, let's start with the California um, basis for UFO uh, activity in the 1950s. This was Giant Rock, of course, and it's George Van Tassel's story, which he wrote a book called When Stars Look Down, and he also had a small restaurant with his wife at Giant Rock, pictured here on the left. And little known to people 30 years later, 40 years later actually, the um, uh, space conventions were held in the 1960s at Giant Rock. Um, and of course, the interesting part about it, from my point of view, is that he also developed some technology. And the technology uh, comprises EM therapy, or electromagnetic therapy, and specifically the uh, construction of the Integratron, which is shown here, and also on a few more pictures we're going to show as well, um, embodies an inverted Tesla coil, a high voltage uh, broadband frequency device. And in Flanders, California, uh, Beefield Boulevard, Belfield Boulevard, you can actually go visit the Integratron. 
And I'm happy to report that on June 20th to 21st, there's a sound healing event happening on the weekend. So Integratron.com is the website. And I'm happy to promote this because it's really a nonprofit in, uh, endeavor by two nursing sisters um, who have dedicated themselves to preserving this building. There are very few structures in the world that can be traced back to UFO contactees. And the Integratron is one, and maybe the, the primary, foremost one. Um, and what's fascinating about it is not only the upper resonant acoustic chamber, no nails were used in the construction at all, but as you sit in the very center, which I have, and so is my wife pictured there, um, we basically are forced into what is kind of a, uh, like a, almost a deafening experience. All the sound you emit comes right back to you. So it's the center of a circular hemispheric chamber um, that has no other echoes except right inside your head. So it's a very fascinating effect. And um, plus we have underneath the Integratron these primary and secondary Tesla coils. So you kind of get the impression that the uh, structure itself is intended to amplify any ambient electromagnetic frequencies. And where would they come from? Well, specifically, they're coming from the atmosphere. And if I had more time, or if you were interested, the book called the Bioelectromagnetic Healing book that I wrote uh, specifically shows the spectrum of the Earth's ionosphere cavity. And it's fascinating that human resonances at 8 hertz and many other frequencies all are available constantly, uh, even out in the desert, for amplifiers and for sensors like this that would um, drive the primary and secondary coil uh, from electricity from the air. And why would a person possibly do that? Well, the purpose specifically is a rejuvenation chamber. And this is what George told us for years. I used to get his newsletters in the 1970s. Um, he said that he was told how to design this from the ETs, and that he also relied upon uh, George Lakofsky, Townsend Brown, Nikola Tesla, and of course the ETs for directions on how to build it. And the idea was that people who would spend time in there would have a rejuvenation effect. Well, to me, for years, I wasn't really sure if this was true or not. Um, I kind of took it on faith and was curious about his dedication to the project. I mean, he died literally trying to finish it. Um, and, and other people finished the last part of it. It went through a lot of change of hands, but today it's in its same original form. Um, very few things need to be done to, except maybe the Tesla coil design, to complete it. Um, but still, the question is why? Well, here's the answer. Uh, as I studied it further, Nikola Tesla is one um, scientist that he relied upon heavily for the design. And what's interesting, I grew up in the western New York area in Buffalo, at which in 1896 actually received and was the first city to have electric street lights, thanks to Niagara Falls. And this was Tesla's um, premier project to specifically generate electricity from falling water and to show it could be transmitted over high distances. Uh, 20 miles was a big distance back then. And, and the other amazing thing, which answers our question, is what do you do with the electricity when you can finally plug a Tesla coil right into the wall? Which happened in just a year or two later. All of a sudden, having AC electricity everywhere in all the homes and businesses, doctors started to pick up on what Tesla pointed out in 1898 was his presentation about the high frequency oscillators for electrotherapeutic and other purposes. Tesla described himself being hooked up to the Tesla coils and getting millions of volts hitting his body. Um, and of course, he indicated this was helpful, therapeutic, and it seemed to alleviate some of his symptoms. Well, the physicians who studied this at the American Electrotherapeutic Association, years later, they actually noticed it had highly beneficial results with cancer. And this is a quote from Dr. Gustav Kulcher in 1932. 
And so I sponsored a conference, our institute sponsored a conference in uh, 2003 to celebrate the 1903 wireless transmission of power that was supposed to happen as Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower was erected on Long Island. And the book that was written in commemoration of that is called Harnessing the Wheelwork of Nature, Tesla's Science of Energy. And these are some of the circuits that are in the Tesla article I just pointed to from 1898, published in the Electro Engineer. You see there's a, a liquid bath with two electrodes that a person would, this is the patient's body by the way, the star, I just added the red star to focus your attention on where the person would stand or, or sit. <clears throat> Figure one is actually uh, allowing the currents to flow through your skin or over the all, and contact every part of your skin. Um, the figure two shows a magnetic coupling, so your whole body is exposed to high frequency magnetic fields. And then the um, figure five, which is actually the most popular way of doing it, has the Tesla coil secondary electrode being in close proximity to the body. So you get all the electricity, but not necessarily the, the amount of current that you would in these other uh, modes. And then this uses two different uh, electrodes. So this was developed to quite a degree. And, and surprisingly, as the early 1900s went on, all of a sudden the AMA and the FDA stepped in. It was literally a, a consortium of both. But let me at least finish the Tesla um, promotion by stating his, his quote here. The body of a person may be subjected without danger to electrical voltages vastly in excess of any producible by ordinary apparatus and they may amount to several million volts, as has been shown in practice. And the surprising thing for years as I read that, several million volts, I was thinking, my God, that seems like incredible voltage. It's got to be dangerous, you know? I mean, how would anybody withstand that, you know? So, but I came up with an answer. Uh, and to me, it's fabulous. It's so surprising, you'll be surprised too. Now, tissues are condensers is a very famous quote of Tesla's. And I have a footnote here indicating it's now called capacitors. Now, these are like parallel plate charge storage devices. And you see that when you're hooked up, as I have one to show, uh, a small Tesla coil device, your whole body all of a sudden becomes charged up to the same voltage. And you can light a light bulb exactly like Tesla did with your hand. And these are the kind of devices that became available within a few years after Tesla promoted them. Um, and they tended to use the noble gas, like argon or neon or krypton or xenon, in the uh, tube that's connected to it. And you see another one here with an electrode and a handle uh, being applied by a physician. And the interesting combination of that is, first of all, the gas provides the resistance. So the electricity doesn't have a high current coupling to your body. But also you get a lot of energy from the noble gas. You get some visible frequencies, and there's some theories nowadays that the noble gas itself transmits some very interesting uh, connections. And I threw this extra um, endorsement by the Hydropower Commission of Ontario because they actually endorsed the Branson uh, generator, the Branson Junior as well, back in uh, the early 1900s. I think this was around 1925 or so. Okay, now the burning question is, why is millions of volts, why are millions of volts safe for the body? Well, it turns out that the cell membrane, which you see at the top here, this is a, the best rendition that a uh, science poster you can get online from a science uh, uh, supply house for schools can provide. The cross-section view of your cell membrane. Every cell in your body has all of this photophospholipids and uh, various proteins, transmembrane proteins. Now, the interesting thing here, the membrane itself is that thick. It's basically on the order of nanometers. And uh, we're looking at the fact that the um, voltage normally across there, across the transmem across the membrane, in other words, transmembrane voltage, is 70 to 100 millivolts. Well, that may not seem like very much. Millivolts is real small, so why, why even consider it? Even show it up here, 100 millivolts across. <clears throat> well, it turns out that when you have such a small distance, you can take voltage over distance, and guess what you get? 100,000 volts per centimeter, or 10 million volts per meter. Bingo. We now understand why Tesla was right. 
because the cell membrane likes to produce 10 million volts per meter. <laughs> One meter is about three feet, 10 million volts across it. Um, hey, that would be pretty dangerous across one meter. You know, I could be electrocuted. But your cells are not electrocuted. These things are tremendous insulators. They're natural dielectrics that want that voltage. They want the voltage gradient to be as high as 10 million volts per meter, or in other words, the, the smaller voltage per smaller distance. But it's the same voltage gradient. So when you get exposed to a Tesla coil of millions of volts, your cells just get all happy because they got all charged up. And I've seen it. I've literally seen people sit next to a Tesla coil and all of a sudden, especially if they come in like this, you know, or there's something wrong, they have some health challenge and they're really low energy. Man, they sit there for a few minutes. Hey, they're energetic and we get all kinds of endorsements and letters. And people that sell the full size, six foot tall Tesla coil devices, um, they get lots of uh, cure uh, anecdotes. So this is a fantastic discovery. We're rediscovering electrotherapy that's been known 100 years ago, and everyone sort of forgot about it. But now we, I think, we have, and doctors that I know that are using this, we all believe that there's greater hope for its adoption. And this is ex exactly what Van Tassel was saying too. You know, he knew the technology should work, he didn't understand why. Tesla was the same way, but now we have the scientific explanation. So there's a lot more hope for the medical profession to make the transition from pharmaceuticals that have tons of side effects to electrotherapy, which literally has virtually none. It's hard to find side effects of these, and it's, that's one beautiful benefit. It's so compatible with natural things. Lakovsky was mentioned as an interest of Van Tassel, so I thought I'd show you what Lakovsky did. He's actually reviewed in my book, Bioelectromagnetic Healing. And there's a company that actually sells a Lakovsky multi-wave oscillator. That's what MWO stands for. Um, it's EffortTechnology.com. And I give uh, credit to the company for doing that because they've pursued for years offering this technology to the public. And it follows, this is an original diagram from uh, Lakovsky's uh, patent, the original patent that uh, Lakovsky designed and, and, and got. U.S. patent 19, whoops, let's see if I can back up here, uh, 1962565. .565. And he wrote a book, Secrets of Life. He wrote another book, 1949, The Waves That Heal. And the 1925 article from Radio News is probably the most uh, astonishing because once again, the interesting application of curing cancer with a device like this is um, also um, endorsed. Now, years later, 1983, I was able to obtain these spectrum pictures. Uh, there's also one for kilohertz that's in my book as well, but to show you the fact that this is unusual, this type of device, whether it's the Lakovsky multiwave or it's another Tesla type device, um, it's, a it's a broadband multi-frequency device. It, to give you an idea of what we're talking about, because a lot of people can't appreciate even what these graphs mean, is that it's like going to the, um, to the store and, and finding only one type of bread, and it's white bread and it happens to be Wonder Bread, and yet you are looking for an assortment of multigrain. Well, we don't sell that, we only sell, you know, it's like Henry Ford, any color you want as long as it's black. <laughs> well, that's pretty much what we get. We get 60 cycle all the time. And we get one megahertz frequency from, you know, maybe the dominant cell tower that's near your house. Uh, you're getting bombarded with a limited bandwidth of frequencies. And you're getting overdosed because it's usually 24 hours a day. Instead, if you sit next to one of these, you're getting kilohertz, megahertz, and frequency. It's literally like a big waterfall of all the energy frequencies the body could ever want. And the interesting thing I discovered is that it turns out to feed biophotons. As the cell DNA in your nucleus gets all these frequencies, it charges up. And then it can shoot out these special type of photons called biophotons that are transmitted with almost no attenuation throughout your entire body. It's faster than your nervous system, literally. So you actually have um, a communication system that gets charged from these types of uh, high frequency baths. Even going out in sunlight, everyone really can benefit from 10 to 15 minutes of sunlight every day, or at least twice a week, because it'll charge up your DNA. 
The other discovery I made in, re in regards to this whole research project of bioenergetics is that electrons are the active ingredient called antioxidants. When you take an antioxidant, it donates an electron to kill the free radicals. And the free radicals gobble it up and stop multiplying. Um, and so there's lots of um, basic research that's proven this. Free radicals steal electrons. Um, if you take a shower, for example, under unfiltered water, not many people buy shower filters, but you should. And the main thing is if your water is being chlorinated, then you're getting a chlorine bath as you take that shower. And each chlorine atom, because chlorine disassociates at body temperature, it's in every organic chemistry book. <laughs> and as it dissociates, it creates a free radical, it's Cl minus. And as it gets absorbed in your skin, it multiplies about 10,000 times. So it creates 10,000 free radicals from one atom. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a serious aging issue. And that's another thing I love sharing with the audiences because not many people know this is a major cause of aging. And then we kind of see, well, maybe George Van Tassel was right. There's a direct connection here now between what he thought rejuvenation was all about and what the science now is uh, indicating. For example, here's a very interesting title. Dying before their time, studies of prematurely old mice hint that DNA mutations underlie aging. <clears throat> and mitochondria suffers from the same problem. So this and much more is contained in the um, bioelectromagnetic healing book. And as I indicate, something to take with you, short-term exposure to high voltage strengthens the immune system. Long-term exposure is chronic and should be avoided. Well, the devices that um, my institute developed basically involve larger, uh, this was a suitcase style Tesla coil. It took me a couple of years to find a way to put high voltage into a box. Um, but we sold a few of those and I feel that it was easier and more beneficial to have a smaller device, which we call the Premier Junior, almost like the Branston Junior, um, to be available to the public. And I made sure that it's well insulated. So you can't get shocked from any part than the noble gas tube itself. And here's a doctor, a uh, friend of ours, that has one and very happy with his effect on the arthritis that he has in his shoulders. <coughs> And of course, I even got involved in an electric chair, but no, nope, I couldn't call it that. I had to call it the energy chair. So, um, so as a matter of fact, this is the prototype with a Tesla coil underneath, and then essentially connected to a couple of static mats that are on the armrest. And that's enough for you to literally do the famous Tesla experiment, which is pictured here. Take a fluorescent bulb in your hand, and it lights up. And that's the exciting part about high voltage. Your whole body immediately gets up to that high voltage right away. And it's a recreation of what they called that auto condensation couch, which remember there was figure one where somebody would actually lay on a uh, type of a bed, whether it's liquid or not. Um, this was actually available years ago. And even yogis say electricity can heal the body. Electricity and rays are finer in nature than solids or liquids, therefore a more subtle force for healing, says Yogananda. Well, why would I mention Yogananda? Well, as a matter of fact, only three miles from Integratron is giant rock, as you know, and this is a link to our second UFO project, permanent magnet motors. Turns out that the experience I had in 1980 was to get a postcard for this book called Sunburst Return of the Ancients by Norman Paulson and I was curious about the book enough to buy it. And then as I read about it, the first half was all about his years with Yogananda. There's his picture right there, and there's Master Yogananda. And then the next half was all about UFOs. So I was thinking, gee, this is the strangest book I've ever read. <laughs> you have two, you know, diverse topics combined together. But hey, that's his life. And I was also very curious about these kind of reports. Here's probably one of the best photos ever taken above Giant Rock to show you how um, much of a nexus and a magnet it was for UFOs during daylight hours. The ship over Giant Rock, people are casually walking backward and forward, but here the smart deputy sheriff takes the photo and preserves for history, for posterity, the, uh, the amazing phenomenon. Now, this to them, apparently, it was so commonplace 
as George Van Tassel apparently was the contactee that kept pulling in, who knows, pulling in the ships, but it was a repeated phenomenon. I've talked to eyewitnesses who had been there and remember seeing UFOs more than once at Giant Rock. Uh, and lots of different ways that we know today for what they call vectoring and telepathically attracting. Um, but uh, certainly this, this is very unusual to see. Um, and, and also to me, technologically, this is also uh, revealing in terms of the light effect below the craft as being different than surrounding above it and to the left and right. So this is indication of some anti-gravity force that has this extra um, fluorescence or light emission, uh, which we can kind of suspect for most UFO lighted uh, saucers. They perhaps have that connection between light emission and anti-gravity. Well, what attracted me to this was this particular passage. Here's Paulson quoting what he claimed was an elder that was the ET on the ship. He had an uh, experience on the ship. And he's told that the outside parameter of each disk, which was the size of the ship, carried 12 magnets. And he said they could draw off electric current from the central hubs and generating perpetual flow of electric energy. Who doesn't like a perpetual flow of electric energy? <laughs> well, we all do, of course, and I, my eyes light up. And the interesting thing was two of them together, f f uh, turning in opposite directions, created the anti-gravity effect. So we have a combination that's ideal for space travel. You get uh, transportation force and, and also electricity, and that's the artist's rendition of what we just saw in the photo of, of what the ship actually looked like. And the strange thing is, and I still can't explain it this day, Norman Paulson, bless his soul, he passed away last year, he took this passage out of every single edition afterwards. That first edition, Sunburst Return of the Agents, there's only a few used copies on Amazon available, is the only one that contains these words. Apparently he thought, and he was told, that mankind wasn't ready for this technology. Well, I think they are, and I think the world is ready too, and we better have it sooner than later. Um, but the nice thing was, I kind of got real excited back then, because here I am, basically 30 years old, and thinking, I'm going to go back to my university professor at the University of Buffalo, sunny of Buffalo, and, um, and, and convince him that I got a project to work on for my master's degree in physics, which I did. And there's the generator I actually built, and that's in my Hummelpolar handbook. So I was one of the few guys in graduate school that actually convinced their professor of something to do, and so I still kept my independence. My independent frame of mind was, was not tainted by the you know, coercion and the hypnosis that most grad students get when they finally get filed out of the, of the uh, programming that, that really are, is serious when you get to the standard model and what science accepts and what it doesn't accept and all that's impossible. So I was able to avoid a lot of it and keep my freedom of thought. Needless to say, I have to be very honest that the single homopolar, which is a circular we're talking about a circular 12-inch magnet, uh, very similar to what the Earth has at the core, develops back torque as it generates current. So that slows it down. So I was hoping, based on Bruce De Palma's work, who basically was hired by the Sunburst community to build a $25,000 Sunburst machine, um, he claimed that you could avoid back torque by doing certain things with the magnetic field. Um, since I measured the back torque, I can say that this particular single homopolar generator, which was invented by Faraday back in 1831, um, is not necessarily the way to free energy. However, it's got a life of its own, and back then, Edgar Mitchell became interested, astronaut Edgar Mitchell. <clears throat> he got interested in investing in the De Palma machine, and there's the De Palma creation of a motor and generator combination which he thought would run itself. Well, Edgar was smart. He kept his money in his pocket right there. And, um, and he hired a consultant, a physics uh, engineering uh, professor, to write a short discourse on, on the Faraday generator, the homopolar generator, in other words, and, and essentially what is known about it. So, um, so he saved his money. And as De Palma kept building these, they essentially didn't run themselves. And, um, and the interesting thing is, and this is a, probably a prophetic um, 
cover of Extraordinary Science from 1994. <clears throat> On the cover, we also see the Searle disk. Some people may or may not know about John Searle, John R. Searle. Um, I met him in 1980 as well when I went to Hanover, Germany to give the talk that Bruce De Palma was supposed to give in Germany. And I essentially talked about the homopolar that I was going to build, but I got to meet John Searle as well. So I didn't think the two were related. I didn't think either one had common technology, but they do. And to tell you the truth, John Searle, who developed this, uh, that's the, one of the better renditions of the um, Searle disk, he had missing time as a kid and then started building these devices and disks, as you see. And this is a rendition, artist rendition, of what the Searle device is supposed to do. Well, I actually was able to, um, uh, before I tell you that, I'll just point out the Searle disk allegedly provides not only electricity, but also anti-gravity. And the story goes that he built these disks, they were able to fly up in the air, he was able to radio control them by actually controlling some of the levers, and the frequency uh, was easily um, uh, transmittable. And he needed about three of these rings to really have an effect. And then he could pull power off by stationary coils that were nearby for electricity output. Now, the interesting thing was each of these disks on the side here um, qualifies as a homopolar generator. And that's John Thomas, by the way, the biographer of Anti-Gravity Made Real, which is a biography of John Searle. And there he is, living legend. He's still alive today. Uh, for 50 years now, he's been telling people about these stories, and I'll tell you, it's, it's amazing to see, and I've seen it more than once, uh, a contactee who gets like a download of information, and then he's overloaded, he gets real busy, he starts creating stuff, and I've seen it with two other people as well. They're, they're prodigy, prodigies for years, and people, of course, don't understand what they're doing with the technology. As you can see here, this craft is actually up in the air, and these are the two guys, John Searles and uh, with his friend, pointing to it. But notice these particular louvers are upwards. They're open. In other words, they're not conducting the voltage to the ex external rim. Well, as we look at what's called electrogravitics or electrokinetics, which I'll refer to in a few minutes, um, this is an essential way of steering the disk. <laughs> because it makes this front part charged up to a positive voltage, and then the back part has a lower voltage, which can be interpreted as a negative voltage. So you can predict just from the arrangement that we see there that that disk is going to go upwards, or in other words, toward us, just because those louvers are open. Um, so I'm discovering the rationale behind some of the creations that he did. And down here, I actually met some of the witnesses that were there when he built the biggest one in the forest. Um, which I don't believe was ever finished, because unfortunately John Searle also was very paranoid, and that tends to be a bad combination of the two. Uh, creativity and paranoia <laughs> doesn't survive too long. Um, Anti-Gravity Dream Made Reality is a, the only living biography of John Searle right now. Um, but as the story progresses, as my life story progresses, uh, we come up to 1990. And in 1990, Searle gives a talk in Berlin. <clears throat> and that gets videotaped. It's like a four-hour videotape. I've seen most of it, actually. And the videotape is a detailed description of how he built the device, how he made the rollers. I used to talk with him and converse with him and correspond with him as well. It was a very sophisticated way of imprinting each roller so that the rollers would basically be toggled into rolling around the ring instead of just sim simply slipping around the ring. And that rolling is very important. Um, and as it turns out, a couple of Russians actually saw the video and decided in the 1990s to go ahead and build the Searle device. And what they did was they built the 12 roller magnets around a ring, and all of a sudden my lights went off in my brain thinking, oh, I found the device that has 12 magnets around the outer edge. But um, time will tell, as the Russians are still working to this day, on recreating their original device that was destroyed because they couldn't pay for the parts that went into it um, back in the 1990s. And then I helped them also de design and, and file for and then obtain a U.S. patent, uh, which is 6822361. And so I was happy to do that. And, and you know, one thing that causes a little consternation here, 
why would anybody build a magnetic motor with lots of connections and baffles and concrete floors with, with uh, calibrated springs and shock absorbers unless you're afraid the thing's going to go upwards. <laughs> and the Russians are definitely over-engineering it to not only prevent it from taking off, but also to keep track of how much lifting force it has. And so they were able to do that. And this is a starter motor that once it gets up to 600 RPM, according to all their published reports, and they have published in uh, peer-reviewed journal articles, I might add, um, then they can disconnect the starter motor. They were even at the um, Joint Propulsion Conference in Salt Lake City um, in 2002, and, and I was there with them, uh, uh, accompanying them. And of course, they just had lots of criticism. In fact, the uh, Breakthrough Propulsion Group, you know, Mark Millis from NASA, <coughs> I asked Mark the next day, how'd you like the Russian proposal, uh, pr uh, presentation? And he said, oh, there's too many outrageous claims. <laughs> that's the easiest way to dismiss a whole technology, you know. And, and that's constantly happening all day long. Don't, it doesn't matter if it works or not. If it's outrageous, it can't be true. You know? yeah. So, so uh, Ivan, who's the investor, calls it the magnetic energy converter. We're hoping energy and propulsion systems will eventually see its way daylight in terms of um, performance and repeated sales. And I'm happy to report the U.S. Department of Energy was supportive in, in hosting the Russians for a full day. Uh, getting a couple DOE employees, engineers, to actually sit through the whole, in, we call it interrogation actually, because uh, this was due diligence. You know, we're bringing over Russians. We had a, luckily a Russian translator that was provided by the Department of Energy for that day. And there's Godin Roshan, by the way, in the center. That's Godin, he speaks English. Vladimir Roshan, who knows everything, doesn't speak English. Um, but the, the idea was, are they telling the truth? Well, the best way to find out if, you, if they tell the truth, let them talk for hours and hours and see if they contradict each other. And essentially, that's what all of us did for the whole day. And then we spent another day, another day for a full week. Um, and we got glowing endorsements from both the uh, Department of Energy people. So, um, so the investor, who's Ivan right there, um, he decided to go ahead with the funding and is considered uh, constantly uh, supported. This is the only photo I'm allowed to show you. And it is the motor from four or five years ago uh, that's in Moscow right now. And you can see it's fairly big. And there's all the hardware I'm talking about, big heavy hardware to prevent it from taking off. <laughs> so, um, so these guys uh, are aware and apparently were aware 10 years ago when they first built it of the potential for getting both um, outputs. Their intent obviously is simply to make an electricity generator. And that probably is a good way to consider using back-engineered technology these days. Let's satisfy the immediate need first and transportation second. And that would be good advice for any of these. <clears throat> now, of course, I uh, branched out a little bit more into some of these other magnetic technologies. And one I found a great interest in was one that appeared in 1979 in Popular Science. And this is called the cure Taco motor. And what's interesting is that it uh, uses a spiral stator that increases in its distance from the center. And this can be used in the repulsive or attractive mode. But in the attractive mode, we'd be seeing it become closer and closer. And this is the repulsive mode so that we'd be repelling the uh, uh, rotor to move in the circular direction. Now, of course, the Japanese, unfortunately, didn't have many, many ideas for technology back in 18, I'm sorry, 1979. And all they could think of was to use a little solenoid and pulse it with magnetics using electricity. But how can you generate electricity if you're using electricity to make it run? That usually is not a free energy device. And of course, all the patents they produced didn't result in a um, commercialable, commercializable object. So this sort of sat on the shelf. It sat in my files for 10 years. And then I came across an inventor named Paul Sprain who hired me as a consultant to work on the device. And he applied for a patent, failed to mention any of the Japanese patents so he could get his own, you know. But essentially, he did the same thing they did. Um, but to me, I have lots of interest in this because as you review the physics literature, magnets are a source of energy. 
And what's interesting is I've now corresponded and collaborated with some physicists. We can now predict, and I'm writing a journal article at the moment, that specifically will connect magnetic energy or magnetic fields to zero-point energy. So I'm very happy to uh, announce that uh, prediction and, and the connection. Um, and, it's, and it's a way to then encourage motors like this to be researched, developed, and finally get to market. To explain what the gradient or the inhomogeneous magnetic fields are all about, um, I can just simply refer you to what's called the stern gerlach experiment. In physics, this is a, a physics undergraduate experiment that's very well known, and it separates protons, spinning protons, in two directions, spin up or spin down. And what's fascinating is from Shom's outline, we actually get the equation. As the magnetic field changes, you get a force in, in the linear direction. And there are patents, such as the Hartman patent, 4215330, that shows how to do it in a linear fashion, as the magnets get closer and closer. And this thing can shoot a ball, as you see on the side here, up a 10 degree incline and drop it off into space. And the patent actually shows how you could gang these into a chain of them. And perhaps, oh my goodness, anybody think about closing the loop? Well, he doesn't luckily propose that, but it's obvious that it could be done. So people skirt the issue of perpetual motion because obviously that's a good way to get banned from any scientific journal, but it's getting mentioned more now in Nature magazine, Science magazine, and the fascinating thing to me is whenever I see it in regards to some of these zero-point energy quantum converters and also magnetic motors, is they tend to use the Latin phrase, the perpetuous, uh, perpetual mobile. And, um, and then they say it could be viewed as this, but it's not. And this is the thermodynamic explanation of why it's not. Well, in this case, we have the same type of thing. And as we see this Paul Sprain device with the same electromagnet that um, Kier Tycho used um, 30 years ago, we realize that there's probably better ways to do it. And one of the ways I've come up with, actually two ways, are using wagon wires that provide a pulse. If you go in any hotel door, for example, do you ever think of what happens when you put your card in? Well, you're firing um, a special type of wire that does a Barkhausen collapse of a whole bunch of domains in, in uh, connection, also in series, like a chain reaction, and then all of a sudden you get a little bit of electrical pulse. It lights up the LED and switches the switch, so your door opens. There's no electricity in that door. That's the fascinating part of it. You're, you're supplying all the energy to open the door latch with that little card that you have for the next hotel you go, go in. So wagon wires are very fascinating because they use magnetic domains in a very advantageous way. And that's exactly what I propose with things like this that would use the um, piezoelectric and magnetostrictive materials that have now been published in IEEE Transaction on Magnetics you put them together and you get a magnetic field on demand whenever you supply voltage with literally no power. And that's a quote from the title of one of the IEEE uh, uh, articles. Uh, Uno, U-E-N-O -E is the, um, the professor from Japan who's discovered the, this combination. <clears throat> so things like that, I realized, hey, this could be researched, this could be developed and replace the electromagnet so then we will have a repeating cycle and perhaps many on a disk, on a shaft in other words. So I see a future for magnetic motors just with the spiral, even if the uh, 12 magnet Searle disk is not necessarily developed. But hopefully we'll see all of them available on the market soon. Here's another one I looked at. Um, Parendovpower.com, parendov-power.com is another example of an inventor who's obsessed with magnets being a source of power. And there's lots of them out there. You can see YouTube full of these ideas. But the interesting thing about this particular model is it uses three disks with uh, magnets that are at an angle. And when I studied the um, profile of the magnet, it's an asymmetric distribution of, of magnetism. So I thought, well, maybe there's some hope in doing this. And thanks to the Disclosure Project, uh, Stephen Greer, as well as uh, from Ivan Kruglak, I was able to raise $2,000 and build a replica of it. And I'm happy to show you a clip from Discovery Channel that shows it in, in reality. Whether you believe that, that the UFOs are ours or alien,
there's certainly something that's showing non-fossil fuel related transport. You know, I've spoken to hundreds of people who've said, yeah, this object stopped over my head and, and took off like a bullet silently. Well, this is not 100 octane petroleum here. This is something far beyond. So the question is, what is it? So if alien craft are using some advanced technology we don't know about, what might it be? We were hoping you'd ask. Tom Vallone is one of a small band of scientists working on various theories that could explain how alien craft travel intergalactically, if indeed they do. The flying saucers travel thousands of miles in seconds. Vallone believes aliens can travel light years through space because they've come up with a source of energy that never runs out. Which means it's a lot cheaper and more reliable than the stuff you find here on Earth. Sounds cool. We couldn't possibly imagine that UFOs would be burning rocket fuel. You can't even get to Mars today with rocket fuel. So we have to accept the fact that if there are vehicles that can travel interplanetary and perhaps interstellar, uh, they have to use an onboard fuel source that is converting ambient energy or have such a con concentrated form of energy that it can survive over light years of travel. Hmm. And how might they do that? The current UFO research points to uh, many different technologies that can be used for free energy and what we call anti-gravity propulsion. Solving the problem of anti-gravity has challenged the greatest minds in physics. But Thomas spent many months locked in his garden shed trying to figure it out. He's even built a little replica UFO. One UFO contact he reported, uh, a disc the size of the UFO that had magnets on the outer edge. And so here we actually have a disc that has magnets on the outer edge that perhaps may be powered by some means that involve permanent magnets or some arrangement of permanent magnets. According to Vallone, the separate halves of UFOs might rotate to create energy that can be harnessed to power the spaceship. The beauty of this energy is that it comes out of nowhere. You don't need to do anything so last century is actually burning fuel. In fact, it's like you're creating it out of thin air. So you can see why Tom is still in his shed. That literally was my lab for six years until I finally won my arbitration case with a patent office. And then I was able to move into a real lab. But um, of course they took advantage of that uh, <laughs> small uh, limited uh, facility to uh, give a couple insults. But it, it's certainly, I thought, a, a good introduction to the subject. So moving on to what we now understand is the real basis of not only magnetic fields, but a whole host of other phenomena. I'd like to introduce you to the third project, and that is the quantum vacuum. In other words, zero point energy. It's uh, a known physics fact, and it's been known for at least 100 years, that quantum fluctuations in the vacuum not only create virtual particles, but the virtual particles provide mechanical force. And as two plates, uh, parallel plates, are brought together within one micron, a millionth of a meter of uh, spacing, the force becomes tremendously strong, almost impossible to pull apart. And in the nanotechnology world, once you get uh, smaller than a micron of spacing, you can also get stiction. And the stiction literally is Two, part of, two parts stuck together where they can't be pulled apart without destroying them. And that's what we're showing in the lower um, picture here that's from a um, Scientific American article on the subject. And the explanation is that the two plates restrict the number of frequencies that the quantum vacuum can actually manufacture when it produces virtual particles. Whereas outside the plates, you get the full spectrum, almost like the Tesla coil, full spectrum availability. So there's a lot more virtual particles of various forces outside than there are inside. And you know, we had a, um, a keynote speaker at our uh, Conference on Future Energy a few years ago in 2006, Dr. Fabrizio Pino, JPL, um, former engineer, and he found a correlation to when two boats come within a certain space on, on any water, out in the ocean, for example. 
Um, and it's a well-known phenomenon, he said, especially with sailboats, but even without any type of boats. He said, if you get too close, invariably those boats will hit each other. And it's based on the same explanation. There are more wave frequencies outside the boats than are in between. So the fascinating thing is that zero-point energy is not a conserved system. It's an open system. So it can be used as a source of energy, except most um, experts, quote-unquote experts, would tend to say, oh, it's such a low-density energy. It's, uh, you know, down to the zero point of temperature. So we can't possibly imagine how it could be used. And I've used those quotes in my book, uh, Zero Point Energy Fuel of the Future. But here's NASA's uh, website, nasa.gov, showing the density to be anywhere from 10 to the 24th up to 10 to the 58th joules per meter cube. And it's also related to gravity and inertia, which to me is very fascinating. So one thing we've looked at, and I've proposed a research project that looks like it'll finally be funded uh, very soon, and that is using zero bias diodes. And the interesting uh, direction that we're going in is that there's lots of ways to harness zero point energy. Many of them and most of them have not been used today, except perhaps by Black Project uh, engineers. However, when you look at the activity that the quantum vacuum has created everywhere, including your atoms, every nucleus and the electron are pushed apart, even though they're electrostatically attracted to each other, they're pushed apart by the quantum activity of the virtual particles. And this has been proven by Hal Putoff's journal article in the Physical Review. So we're looked at, uh, you kind of look at as an engineer, and I've written two books on this now, is that what's the easiest way to convert this energy? You know, how would UFOs do it? How would engineers do it? How could we do it? Well, solid state diodes are perhaps the simplest, the most reliable, and maybe the longest lasting conversion method known to man. And this is an example of a zero buoyant, uh, a, a diode array that could be converted to a zero bias diode. And the reason I'm using zero bias is that specifically we don't want to add electricity to a free energy device, which would mean you're adding voltage bias to overcome a certain uh, in, 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 innate um, voltage barrier. Instead, there are diodes on the market today that operate with zero bias. And I've given this whole paper just on this topic to the um, um, space and power uh, engineering group that is part of the American Institute of Physics. And in fact, I have a couple copies of the paper available afterwards if you'd like to pick one up. So we see that not only can we look at electricity that uh, can be developed by diodes, but here's another uh, published conversion method, which may or may not being, uh, be used um, on advanced uh, aircraft. Um, but Dr. Pinto, who I mentioned before, has now proven in his physical review article that this is thermodynamically feasible. It turns on little micro lasers. Micro uh, lasers are uh, about a micron in size. And this is about 100 microns in, in diameter. So having a small micro laser inside wouldn't present any uh, dimensional problems. But the fascinating thing is, and this is what's called the vacuum uh, engineer's toolkit. I actually posted this entire grocery list of all the effects you can use that are very weird. They're, I mean, the quantum world is weird anyways. I, <laughs> you probably heard that more places than one. But as you explore the um, quantum world related to zero point energy, there's a whole bunch of very exciting ways to use the quantum world to your advantage. And one is, as uh, Dr. Pinnell discovered, when you turn a light on, you get 10 times the effect on the dielectric constant of the walls of that cavity. And all of a sudden, the Casimir force gets 10 times stronger. So you're getting a big effect for just a little tweak. And so that's why you can get a, a half of a nanowatt out from every uh, chamber. And if you put a whole bunch together, much like you would with the diode array, we can look at this being a, a power source. And I just heard today that this has already been done with Casimir um, uh, ganging of Casimir cavities together. And if you'd like to read more, this is my original book on it, The uh, Practical Inversion of Zero Point Energy. And I have actually posted this entire thing in PDF on our website. So if you'd like to start with the one that has equations in it, then go for it. That's our website right there, integrityresearchinstitute.org. 
And these are some of the other websites you might consider to research the subject. But to me, it's a fascinating development. And this is the other book that I wrote, really for lay people, for everyday people who have no background in it. I made sure to put a picture on almost every page. Um, and I have a whole chapter that shows you the history of zero-point energy, too. So you get to see all the major players and the scientists that have really contributed to this field uh, extensively. And here's a 1997 article from the New York Times that shows how valuable and popular this particular um, subject was when all of a sudden Dr. Lamoureux um, verified the Casimir force from um, non-conductive to conductive plates. He was the first to actually try conductive plates. And he verified that this was within 5% accurate to the theoretical predictions. So what I'm proposing to you is that zero-point energy is not so esoteric. It's, it's real, it's been accurately described, and yet no one's using it. They're just measuring it, you know, they're getting grants to measure this stuff. So, but now for everyone's favorite topic, can we use it for propulsion? Can we travel to other places? Well, let's look at what I believe is probably the best documented um, UFO story and the one that leads us to a better perspective of our local neighborhood, and that is the Zeta Reticuli incident, or better known as the Betty and Barney Hill story. This was a subject of um, a movie as well, um, and also um, it became, as you see, the Interrupted Journey uh, book as well. Now, we have a few copies of the Zeta Reticuli incident reprint, which is this one, from Astronomy Magazine. And it's also available online at gravitywarpdrive.com. But I'm very interested and also very encouraged by looking at the Astronomy Magazine reprint. Because first of all, does Astronomy Magazine usually reprint UFO stories? No. no. <laughs> Why would they reprint this one? Well, it could have anything to do with the star map. And this is Betty's hand-drawn star map from the perspective of Zeta um, 1 and 2, which are coincidentally only half a light year away from each other. Um, maybe. And what's interesting is this is a star map of all the solar mass sized stars within 50 light years of Earth. Does that mean much to anybody? It should mean a lot to you because these are the only stars that have any chance of having Earth-like planets. Um, gee, it's really nice to have all of that in one map. How did Betty ever get it? Do you think she had another source of information? I think so. Astronomy Magazine thought so. But of course, Carl Sagan didn't think so. He wrote a debunkle, uh, debunker uh, uh, at the very end. But that, that adds more validity to it. Because if he took the trouble to try to debunk this story that has um, a computer-drawn simulation. Oh, by the way, this map wasn't verified for years, as some of you may know. This map is from the Zeta Reticuli perspective. So how could anybody ever figure out if this was a real map or not? Especially the one the way she drew it, you know. Well, it turns out Marjorie Fish took the time, and of course there's our home way up there, one of the weekend jaunts. Uh, Marjorie Fish actually took the time, let me back up a bit to just review the star map one more time. She took the time to actually use this particular map and try to analyze the um, direction and the uh, um, geometric relationships from any perspective. Marjorie Fish was an astronomer who took a detailed um, time to build a bead and string three-dimensional model of our 50 light year neighborhood and put every star in its place where exactly where it should be with a bead and string. <laughs> I mean, I have to give a lot of credit to Marjorie Fish. And then what does Marjorie Fish discover that when you look from the Zeta Reticuli perspective, bingo, that's when the star map actually matches very closely to what is truly the only solar mass sized stars in our, in our 50 light year neighborhood. So this is actually uh, has a, a great story and of course the Astronomy Magazine puts a lot of effort into it. So moving on, let me share with you a very fascinating UFO um, clip. This, I believe, is, is authentic. You can see the spinning of the UFO as well. And as we move, watch how fast it disappears. 
I mean, that's acceleration. Now, do you think anybody survived in that ship as it accelerated so fast? Do you think they were crushed to the back of the seat as they accelerated? Mm, probably not. And, uh, and I'm going to describe to you in a second why I think they are not affected at all as this thing moves real quick. Well, I've had a great interest in the technological discoveries that we can get from UFO stories. And of course, as I shared with you, so did John Searle. Um, and he went to a great extent, as did Townsend Brown. Townsend Brown was the founder of NICAP and spent years building saucers and also analyzing their propulsion capability, their lifting capability. There's a video, for example, of all of his lifter experiments that he did. Um, and of course, you might know about Bob Lazar and Adamski and Andreasen. Well, interestingly enough, Andreasen now has become, I would say, a focal point of activity because we actually have a book that's been written specifically on that uh, incident. But before I show you that slide, uh, let me just review all the basic people that I've known that have actually pursued UFO energy and propulsion. And this is quite sizable. Here's a guy, Brandon Roy Thornson, who I met in 1985 in, um, um, in Ottawa, Canada. And he was giving his presentation. It's on the uh, DVD, Free Energy Race to Zero Point, which was produced in around 1995. I was a technical consultant for that video. And we featured Thornson, who passed the canoe test. Canoes, obviously, have the same symmetrical ends. So if you've got any inertial propulsion device, it's not going to be affected by the water at all. Uh, and he passed the, the pendulum test, where the, you'll see the device staying on one side of the pendulum consistently. Um, but the story goes, as, as Roy told me, uh, firsthand, he said his wife and I, his wife and him were driving down the road and all of a sudden he realized that hours had passed and he drove home. Didn't know what happened in between except he had seen a UFO briefly and then he started having dreams. Lots of dreams about how to build these things. And the strange thing was these are mechanical inertial propulsion things. You'll see it on the video, Free Energy Race to Zero Point. Um, David Hamill, very similar story. He has a little more detail about how he's abducted, gets to see the workings of the ship, similar to Norman Paulson, but then goes back and starts building it. And uh, uh, unlike Thornson, Hamill has his first device that he builds with magnets take off, and he's able to grab a camera fast enough to show it glowing as it takes off. So now he uses granite to build all the rest of them. That's where the name of the book came, because he wants to keep it on the ground as it's generating its energy. I'm not sure if that's going to work anymore, but Jean Manning, my friend, uh, author and reporter, she co-authored a book about him. And um, there's two contactees who've had various, res various um, lack of success, I would say, in getting the product to market even though they had a lot of assistance in getting their input. They got the download, but they couldn't get the output, you know? <laughs> yeah. And who knows what Townsend Brown's story is. He might have seen some stuff, too. I corresponded with him a little bit and actually was disappointed that his materials didn't go too far. But as we found out, the B-2 bomber seems to have a lot of the discoveries that he made because he predicted the uh, charging of the leading edge of the wings and the flame jet generator uh, opposite charge going out. And a friend of mine has actually seen a B-2 flying over Washington, D.C. at night with the glowing blue glow of the leading edge of the wings. So we know they're using that technology. And of course, David Froning, I'll tell you about in a second. Paul Hill, I'll also mention to you in a second. George Van Tassel, I've also uh, referred to. And Bob Lazar. Paula Violet has now come up with a new book, and I'm uh, happy to promote it and mention to you. He took his paper on the B-2 to put it in this book, Secrets of Anti-Gravity Propulsion. And, um, and what I'd like to introduce to you now is Paul Hill's book. <clears throat> Many of you may not know that Paul Hill was a very diligent uh, engineer for years and literally kept great notes on all the UFO sightings that the NASA scientists were actually privy to. <laughs> Uh, I mean, how many scientists would take the time to actually document things that NASA doesn't want anybody to know about, you know? But he did. And, and they had so many UFO sightings that he was able to make the correlation, for example, in the book, that all the effects, he claims, 
obey classical physics. For example, this diagram at the top here shows that as the saucer changed direction, he saw it banking, just like a plane would bank, at the same angle, because he says a force is being projected out of the bottom. So Paul Hill gives you tremendously valuable um, technological detail, including, for example, the 10 Gs of force coming out of the bottom and the initial velocity you'd expect from that um, and the final velocity. So it's, it's making, for example, a 10 G reversal feasible because of his explanations. And so the quick turns and so forth are, are not beyond imagination. Um, and I know the, the fellow that um, um, actually, uh, Bob Wood was the one who actually helped get this book to market uh, after um, Paul Hill's daughter marketed and carried it to UFO conventions year after year. Um, great credit to Bob Wood for, for finally finding a publisher for this manuscript. And now Paula Violetta I also have to give credit for, this is a masterpiece. If you want to get any book on the subjects we've talked about tonight, I highly recommend Secrets of Anti-Gravity Propulsion. He interviews two Black Project engineers who remain nameless, but they give lots of gory details. And so much so that one of the quotes that I used in my book report on this book was that the laws of physics have been rewritten. <laughs> um, and that says a lot. And of course, the Tesla UFOs and Classified Aerospace Technology is the subtitle. And, that, and it's a thick book, it's a fat one. We only have one copy for you to take a look at as a review copy in the back, um, but it's available online. And it's a fast, fascinating collection. <clears throat> and it gives you lots of practical details, which for example, in the Pankladinov experiments, things like that, you can actually see how to build something like this. <clears throat> Historically, for example, anti-gravity has been a subject that goes even back to uh, 1962 when the um, uh, famous Robert Forward from Hughes Research Labs uh, produced this very good physics article um, showing, I, I superimposed one of the diagrams from the article, showing how classical physics can actually produce a gravitational force if your currents and magnetic fields are high enough. Um, and then also, once again, uh, Nick Cook tried to um, give more of a reporter's viewpoint about how much has been done in this field uh, since World War II <clears throat> in the hunt for zero point. And that was also devoted to anti-gravity as well. Well, to give you a, a, a feature that I was promising you in terms of zero point energy and how it could be used for propulsion, I'd like to um, display these graphs here uh, just for your perusal. You don't have to really understand the equations. But look at the similarities between the graph that describes the speed of sound, the drag, in other words, increasing as you reach the speed of sound. This was a barrier, obviously, for years. As Chuck Yeager drove his first jet toward the barrier of 600-some miles per hour, you know, he didn't know if he was going to make it past there or not, but the scientists and engineers thought he could. And, of course, we also have this kind of equation describing the air condensing and, and compressing in the front of the craft. And the equation shows this kind of circular compressions of, of layers of, um, what you say, equal potential lines. And fascinatingly enough, when we compare this with subluminal flight, the special relativity curve just happens to show inertia obeying the same curve. And David Froning is the one who drew these and, and showed me this information. And the speed of sound, speed of light rather, amazingly produces the same compression on some different variables that make up the vacuum, <clears throat> and that is the permeability and permittivity of space. But notice that the curves and the graphs are the same thing. So what he proposes, David's, uh, uh, he's going to be a speaker at our conference on future energy in October in the Washington, D.C. area, and also he's lectured at the American Institute of Astronautics and uh, Aeronautics, for example, in 2002 and many times since then, he proposes that aerodynamic viscous drag is similar to what is called the Lorentz force of the zero-point field. And the resistance versus speed for sound is the same for light. And these are a close-up of the same graphs I just showed you, the speed of sound, speed of light, the drag, similarities of the drag, and the similarities of the um, compression 
effects. So this has been well documented. The wave fronts for both are now similarly um, related. And so he proposes that there is an easy way to overcome the drag in a very analogous way that the uh, speed of sound was overcome. And that is he solved the Euler equations for fluid dynamics and he found that zero point field loses its drag when the temperature gets to be near zero degrees Kelvin. In other words, out near absolute zero. Now what could be more convenient than a craft traveling in outer space at what temperature is outer space? Anybody know? Three degrees Kelvin. Then having an effect that, oh, my ambient air area just happens to help the craft lose its drag. Hey, that's, that's synchronicity and synergy, synergy, if you ask me. So more than that, though, is the zero-point field that's present in outer space, too. And you can read about it at quantumfields.com. Um, is that the zero-point field transfers energy to the vehicle as well. And now we kind of get something that, hey, would be very convenient for interstellar, interplanetary travel, where you get ambient energy being converted as you travel. And this is, would you believe, a circular craft. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, scientifically, this is the best geometry for getting this effect to work around the entire periphery. Design the craft to be circular, toroidal shaped, like a donut. Much like the forward article, which you just saw, that donut shaped coil. So we're seeing similarities in the designs for a scientific reason. And then we start to think maybe UFOs, especially the saucer designs, may have something in common and a, and a raison d'etre, in other words, a reason for its existence. And here's some of the space-time warping and vacuum polarization effects that we can see as we start to perturb the uh, uh, permittivity and permeability of space. Acceleration would be to the left. And what we see here, first of all, as you approach the speed of light according to Froenig, and these are his diagrams he let me use, we get up to what you'd call Mach 99, and this is a speed of sound effect, and this is a speed of light effect. Notice the similarities in, in terms of the colorations, which are analogously showing the same pressure gradients that would be present at the edge or the tip of the craft. And that's in 0.99C. Well, the interesting correlation here, too, is that he discovered that you get positive thermal radiation pressures exerted at high speed, of course, as you move a craft through air. And then you get the opposite, negative zero-point vacuum pressures exerted as you move a vehicle through the vacuum. So it's interesting the vacuum seems to assist, in other words, in providing propulsion in the impulsion in the left-hand direction. See, this, this air retardation is, is, is moving against the motion, which we always know as you travel faster toward the speed of sound. But as we travel forward toward the speed of light, we're going to actually get an increase in speed provided by the vacuum itself. So this is a little known force because we haven't traveled near the speed of light yet. We haven't tried the experiment. <laughs> You know, but we've gotten up to, say, 10, Mach 10, you know, 10 times the speed of uh, sound. Um, but speed of light is uh, a lot faster, 186,000 miles per second. So here are some of his diagrams. This is literally what 2C would look like, twice the speed of light, um, three times the speed of light. I heard a report recently that interstellar travel, especially the ones like the Betty and Barney Hill story we're regarding, you know, weekend jaunt to one of those stars and so forth. That's the quote from the ETs. Um, that might actually involve, say, um, 3,000 times the speed of light. Then you could actually look at a few days' journey if you're able to retain that. But hey, once you travel fast two or three times the speed of light, you know, what's another five or ten? Uh, it can't be a huge difference, as we've seen with the speed of sound. Um, there's a lot of hypersonic craft now that are being developed by the military that are up to Mach 10 with no trouble. Mach 10 and 12 and 15 is, is commonplace now. <clears throat> well, I'd like to give credit to the Disclosure Project for including this concept and this idea of getting technical details of any type of sighting when you come to the actual craft and its um, construction. 
And this is right from the disclosure book by Stephen Greer, 1952 study, uh, citing. And here's uh, another uh, UFO uh, video from Fox TV as some of this was declassified. Okay, here it goes. Are we alone? It's a question people have pondered for centuries. And now, new declassified documents could prove we're not. Among the evidence out there, strange lights over the U.S. Capitol more than 50 years ago. Fox 5's Brooke Baldwin investigates UFOs in Washington. Phoenix, Arizona, March 13th, 1997. Actually happens. This isn't a figment of somebody's imagination. Chicago, Illinois, November 7th, 2006. I got it on tape! I got it! Dublin, Texas, January 8th, 2008. This is an amazing sight. This, this, is, this is unheard of. Eyewitnesses report something mysterious in the skies. I hear the humming noise. It goes over the house, goes into the field. I see the lights. People claiming to have had an out-of-this-world experience. People think I'm crazy because I will come forward and tell this story. Three unusual sightings caught on tape, each, according to some, has a reasonable and logical explanation. This is the planet Venus. Others, though, believe these sightings are something bigger, something from another galaxy. We were talking about hundreds of thousands of cases, and I don't think there's a single day where there aren't the very strong cases that are reported somewhere in the world. An alien invasion or a government cover-up. These recently declassified documents show just how seriously the government has treated these sightings, including one front-page story here in D.C. The sky is the stage, the actors, so-called flying saucers. And they're back on the scene with some new twists. July 1952, air traffic controllers at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland pick up 10 to 12 unidentified objects on radar. Minutes later, another sighting, this time at Washington National Airport. The Air Force sent up two fighter aircraft to intercept the flying objects, according to confidential security information now released to the public. The Air Force did respond to scrambled jets, and it was damaged, photographed over, I believe there were nine of them at one point that were actually seen in formation. Dr. Stephen M. Greer is the founder of the Disclosure Project. His organization collects information on unexplained sightings from all over the world, including the more than 2,000 reports around D.C. in the summer of 52, now known as the Washington Nationals. It's been very hard to bring out the information without it getting linked instantly to something that ends up being embarrassing. This famous photo shows seven bright objects flying near the Capitol Dome. Radar also picked up four more objects in Beltsville and in Herndon. <laughs> Facing increased pressure from the public, the military held a news conference saying the objects seen throughout the region were weather-related, nothing more than, quote, temperature inversion. We have, as a date, come to only one firm conclusion with respect to this remaining percentage, and that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. A conceivable threat that made it all the way to the Oval Office. The president got very interested and wanted some kind of a solution. Reserve Air Force Captain Kevin Randall has been studying UFOs for years. He's written mm -hmm. 18 books, one of them specifically about the D.C. sightings. The Air Force is basically, well, what it was is temperature inversions. Were there inversion layers over Washington, D.C. in 1950, July of 1950? The answer is yes, there were. Were they of sufficient strength to cause the problems you see on the radar? No. Controversy arises. Maybe the puzzling objects are from another planet. Puzzling objects Dr. Greer believes are behind and cover up at the highest level. Everyone who I know who are military or intel were told, you didn't see this, you were not on the squadron that went up, you were, the radar operators were told, this never happened. But something did happen those July nights. Whether it was alien or not is still debatable. Kevin Randall, though, believes it's only a matter of time before the truth comes out. I believe what's going to happen eventually is there's going to be a UFO event that is inexplicable and leave the evidence behind that we cannot just explain away. Which means events like the Washington Nationals in 1952, the Phoenix Lights in 1997, the saucer over Chicago's O'Hare Airport in 2006, 
signings in Texas earlier this year could just be the beginning. Rick Baldwin, Fox 5 News. So it's great to see the government declassifying this information. And as I promised, I'm also uh, happy to share with you just a few diagrams of what hopefully will be the future of um, back engineering reporting to the civilian population of what these craft are capable of and how they work. Um, this is Paul Potter's newest book, just came out a couple months ago, Gravitational Manipulation of Dome Craft. It's thicker than Paul Violet's book. <laughs> This thing is almost 800 pages, I believe. Um, and it has color plates as well. And I was happy to report that um, a few years ago, uh, I was able to obtain these slides from Paul Potter, and I encouraged him to pursue this work, because as you notice, he's showing the Journal of Applied Physics and references his work and his, his theories uh, to mainstream journal articles on the UFO propulsion dynamics. And without going into a lot of detail about how the theory is, is described, I believe you can tell just from the detail of the diagrams that the uh, electrical charges, the electrofluid, uh, the torque that's being created, the quartz crystal dielectric spheres, um, the, this is an, a very elaborate and very complex type of structure. And he received all this information from the contactee that's written about in both books on the Andrasen Affair Part 1 and 2. <clears throat> and it's interesting to me, too, to see that even the um, inflowing of air is, is part of the uh, polarized air is part of the propulsion system, uh, so that there's a lower pressure and a higher pressure, and of course, even magnetic fields are involved. So I'm uh, excited that maybe someday, he's really writing this for the future, because how many engineers or physicists today would understand this? except for the ones working in the black projects that have rewritten the physics laws and they'll probably eat this up like uh, nothing, you know. But as you can see, he even includes a little circuit diagram too. So that you get the little toroidal generator here hooked up to a capacitor with a toroidal edge and a little dome shell and a little vortex happening with diodes. Man, that's the saucer diagram of the future. And perhaps this helps explain some of the phenomena we see in craft like the um, uh, Grangemouth and, and other ones that involve the um, activation of two of the um, projectiles, which are obviously high voltage projectiles underneath, and one of them being deactivated. This, once again, has to be uh, related to some type of propulsion, and we're happy to at least use the electrogravitics word uh, to identify the fact this is voltage and current being applied. Here's a little more UFO footage. It may not have as much um, um, connectability to the uh, scientific community, but I thought it was fascinating to see what some footage has shown us these days. And whether or not some of these will actually give us the technological information that we like to produce some of this on the, on the Earth uh, remains to be seen. I met Bob Lazar a few years ago, and I, I feel that he has um, really some uh, very interesting information. Whether or not he's um, interpreted it correctly is still something that is a point of contention and, and debatable. Um, but here again, this is uh, Paul Potter's attempt to at least um, document it, display the details, and let the public decide on how this is actually being built, according to the best uh, known eyewitness, and that is Bob Lazar, who spent some time at Area 51. Um, certainly it says something when the report is that the um, ceilings and the uh, size of the craft all were a little bit too small for humans. So you kind of wonder uh, what the craft was designed for. <clears throat> now, once, what I found was very um, valuable in terms of my contribution in just being, um, uh, say, a networker in, in many of these uh, conditions, is to come across a photograph, as you see in front of you, that clearly displays a right angle turn from a triangular craft. And I um, 
I spoke to the person who took the photo. Um, I received his explanation that this photo started with an open shutter, 35 millimeter on a tripod at two o'clock in the morning out in Pine Bush near Stewart Air Force Base. And as he opened the shutter, he could start to see the two lights and then all of a sudden the craft took a right angle turn. And then continued away from the camera with of course the red and green blinking lights that sort of make it look like it's conventional. <laughs> But that right angle turn certainly is unconventional. <laughs> and I gave a copy of this to Bennett Hart at NRO. And I said, hey, your classified projects already have inertial shielding. This photo proves it. Um, we've seen triangular craft all over the world. So much so, the Discovery Institute made a whole report on it. It's on our website, by the way. IRI website has the whole report. And, and there was a, a fellow with his um, uh, telescopic lens on his rifle as he's out looking for something to shoot at he looks through the lens and he can see the writing on one of these triangular craft and it's a US insignia it's a US uh, English word uh, description so uh, so I'm trying to appeal for declassification of just the uh, inertial shielding and why would we think this is something real well it turns out physical review Bernard Hayes uh, Rueda and Putoff the three guys that um, uh, 3001 uh, actually is based on as being the most promising gravitational uh, discovery of the 20th century. They describe the fact inertia is really a Lorentz force connected to the zero point field. And this is a, the, probably the best discovery that's been made because in terms of my interpretation of the, the equation, this means it can be shielded. This means the interaction with the distant stars as the way all physics classes tell you, is really hocus, it's hocus pocus, it's, it's non-physical. This is the real physics, where the zero point field is all pervading, as you turn around your corner on your next drive in your car, you're interacting with the zero point field, and that's what's pushing you toward the wall, or toward the door, as you're making your turn very quickly. And the fascinating part about this, it's electromagnetic. So this means that right angle turn is not something difficult, it's something we can actually produce here on Earth as an electromagnetic phenomenon, much like David Froning is already doing with his toroidal shielding of the whole craft. So what's, what I proposed, and I gave Bennett Hart this diagram too, because this is one of my shield, um, slides that I used at the National Space Society, is that if you use Newton's law, F equals MA, and M, as we all know, all the physicists know, that's just inertial mass. It has nothing to do with gravitational mass. There's only a correspondence principle that says the two might be related. Well, this inertial mass can be reduced. And as we reduce it down to zero, what do you think the acceleration will do? It's gonna go through the roof. <laughs> and that's exactly what we want, you know? So first of all, you get fast acceleration for whatever fuel you're using, or whatever propulsion you're using. And secondly, most important, do you realize that every astronaut who goes to Mars, NASA is already telling the public that every single cell in their body will be penetrated at least once by a cosmic ray. The cancer rate is expected to be high on any Mars-directed astronaut. And furthermore, if a solar flare happens to occur during the trip, forget it. They gotta run into shelter, which will be, as they could predict, only a water type of room, you know, protected by water. So this is much better. Once you get the shield around whatever size or shape craft you have, any incoming particle will also lose its inertial mass as it penetrates the shield and bounce off the shell of the craft rather than penetrate through the craft. As many sci-fi movies show, when the tiny particle comes through, it bursts things, or as uh, Buzz Aldrin reported, he closes his eyes and he's seen blinks of light. And the NASA guy's got to figure out, oh, you're being hit with cosmic rays. Don't worry. You know, it's not going to hurt you. Yeah, right. <laughs> Come back to Earth quick, bud, so you can live a few more years. Um, so this is, our, I think, our only hope is that we need inertial shielding, and we need it soon, really to protect people going to Mars. Well, has NASA even come up with something like this? Do they acknowledge it exists? Yeah, they do. And here's their, their idea. Let's get a whole bunch of spheres together with 50 megavolts. And, um, and somehow put all these shields around some little lunar um, settlement. So that might be a little difficult to bring all of these along 
on the Mars trip, but hey, that's the best that Mars, uh, that NASA can pick up on this kind of concept. But at least they're in the same ballpark. Uh, that I, I give them credit for. <clears throat> and so there's lots of articles you can come across. Some of them I wrote about electrovitics, other ones talking about propulsion theories um, in, in various uh, magazines, including Atlantis Rising and UFO magazine. And I published in UFO sightings the correlation between the Searle disks and the uh, Townsend Brown disk. And this is the Townsend Brown diagram of what the B-2 bomber ends up using years later. So it's a fascinating uh, assembly of many of the propulsion systems that now are currently being used by the military, including, for example, some of these patents from Townsend Brown. This is Townsend Brown holding his saucer, and this is an example of a lifter that essentially uses just the electrostatic field, in other words, the high voltage field, which now has been called ion wind. But many of you perhaps are familiar with this lifter effect. It is providing an upward force and certainly allows this uh, triangular uh, aluminum foil object to hover. But we're basically stating that the um, lifters really are not electrogravitics and, and it's good to identify what these concepts really involve so, these, so they can be scientifically explained. And that's what my second volume does. Electrogravitics 2 explains each one of these phenomena in detail mainly based on the, the Air Force uh, Research Lab uh, results. Because would you believe the Air Force Research Lab has actually investigated some of these reports? And this is the second, this is the first volume, by the way, that reviews some of the early Townsend Brown work and includes a biography of Townsend Brown, as well as some of the uh, experiments that he's done, as well as the um, early explanations of the electrovitics and electrokinetic effects. And then volume two, I'm very happy to report, uh, it contains the Office of Naval Research tests that actually show the voltage and the propulsion efficiency and also disk speed uh, being related in, in this um, log-log graph. And also the Army Research Lab also did their work. And see, they found a very sizable amount of force for a kilowatt input, you get five newtons output, or approximately a pound per kilowatt. And so that's, that's a very uh, useful um, propulsion. Now, what I found and I discovered, and I also report in the book and also in a journal article, which I have extra copies if you'd like, is the fact that the unusual um, propulsion effects that Townsend Brown reported in this very strange article called How I Control Gravitation, in 1929. I mean, here's the founder of NICAP trying to tell people how he controls gravity. And, and of course, in 1929, not many people understood it. He didn't even understand it either. But what he does is he explains that this suspended 44-pound uh, dual dumbbell with a glass rod in between has 100,000 volts applied to it. And as he applies the voltage, all of a sudden, the suspension moves to the right. And then he doesn't understand why it comes back, even though he continues to apply the voltage. Well, NASA found that they could get a patent on it in 2001, but they don't reference Townsend Brown at all. Um, and then even Zinsser, uh, who I met in, in the early 1980s, um, also received a patent and published a number of reports, so we actually put together a book on his subject. He uses a pulsed effect, too. So I found some commonality between these, and this is Zinsser's force balance, where he actually produces an upward force for a small amount of pulsed electro input. And the conclusion to the discovery, which I thought was uh, quite remarkable as we finish up this last topic, is that Dr. Jeff Amenko, who just recently passed away a few months ago from the West Virginia University, coincidentally discovered an amazing equation he calls the electrokinetic equation. And I said, I wrote him a letter. I said, uh, Dr. Jeff Amengo, did you know about Townsend Brown's electrokinetic patents? And I sent him a couple copies of it, which then are explained by this equation. And he said, no, nope, didn't even know Townsend Brown existed. So here's like two inventors, two uh, scientists coming together using the same name to describe the phenomenon. And what this equation tells us 
is that the change of current over time, and that means the faster the current or the higher the current and the shorter the time, creates an electric field or a force. So if you have a pulse that's very quick, you're going to get a very high force. The largest, the fastest pulse current with the shortest rise time will produce the largest force. It's a time derivative. And so all of a sudden, we may have an explanation for some of these craft we've seen on the cover of Herald Tribune, 1955, um, why electrogravitics was such a popular topic in 1956, that all the aerodynamic uh, industries were pursuing electrogravitics then. Um, there were two reports that came out of the uh, Aviation Studies Institute, which still exists today in London, England, all devoted toward electrogravitics. And it was all based on Townsend Brown and his report that we can probably uh, control gravity. Well, the interesting thing is, and this is in my book, it's in the last chapter of the book, I had a fight for years to get this report from Mark McCandlish. Mark McCandlish was one of the Disclosure Project um, contactees or testifying uh, people in 2001. <clears throat> and Mark is an aviation uh, illustrator. And he's predicted many, uh, more than once, a classified uh, aspect of some aircraft. And then he, he's not too popular with the military after he does that. Well, in this case, he was invited to Norton Air Force Base in 1988 to witness this hovercraft. They had three hovercraft going on. A congressman was also there. And he ended up talking with not only his friend who was there, but also the congressional office and eyewitnesses. And he drew this from all of their descriptions. This shows basically two seats on the top, 1950s rivets that were used. This is an old craft that they were just putting on display behind a curtain in a hangar. And, um, and these are uh, capacitor banks at the bottom that are pulsed uh, equally spaced from a distributor in the center. Mark didn't understand how could this possibly work. Well, when I looked at the electrokinetic equation and applied it to this, you can predict you get a downward force. In other words, it would, op uh, it would oppose gravity and, and he fires the capacitors in a triangular mode. So you get a balanced effect every time the capacitor banks are fired. And I gave the credit to help put off for doing due diligence. Well, he got angry that I was giving him association with this. So he sent me an email that was perfect because it tells you in great detail that all he was able to determine was independently interview the source of the story, independently interview another individual, and, um, and then verify the fact that they're both uh, saying the same things. And of course, he thinks it's still in his gray basket of possibly true. But I told Hal, hey, this is a wonderful endorsement of exactly the due diligence work that you did to verify a story that's pretty amazing. So I'm looking forward to seeing the impulse gravity generator finally becoming available to, um, in, in the kinetic equation, uh, verifying this too, that we can actually start repelling the near-Earth object asteroids. Because right now, we have no way to protect the planet. Planetary protection for anything falling into our oceans or falling onto our land from space is basically out the window. This is probably a projectable force that we can actually count on to um, maybe seeing the uh, force of the future for airports with circular craft, and um, who knows, maybe zero-point energy will actually be used to get us to the stars, as Aviation Week says in 2004. Thank you very much.